thank you so much for another day that uh, we would be learning more about you. I pray uh, you give the, the words that you needed for us to hear through rich God. I pray that we would have an open heart, uh, clarity of thought uh, in, in learning this, God. Uh, I pray that we would be able to catch your heart, God, and, and really follow you there. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right, so uh, we're going to pick off where we kind of left off in from Acts 7. After the uh, persecution or, or the death of, of Stephen. Um, Stephen, at this point, he only had like two, two chapters or two, I think six, yeah, six and seven, about two chapters in, in the book of Acts. But he, he is what we would call like the focal point of how the church uh, grew. Um, so we picked off right after he was, uh, where he was martyred. You know, and and then after he was martyred, basically, the, uh, a sudden spread of persecution uh, um, was became very rampant, and it ravaged the church. Um, in Acts eight verse one, it actually started, and Saul approved of his execution. Uh, many believe that this was Paul's turning point, or uh, he was very adamant about the Christians, but he would always look back at this moment. Uh, of course, this is all theory. Yeah? He would always look back at this moment because Luke had enough uh, where all to actually record that Saul was there. So Luke was trying to point out at the beginning, Saul was there. He saw what, what Stephen said. Oh, he heard what Stephen said. He saw what Stephen looked like. When the scripture said he looked like he had the face of an angel. Okay, but it says here, and, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried uh, Stephen and made great lamentations over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So this is how Paul started. Uh, so this is more like a, a prologue of uh, how did Paul become a Christian? So we will deal with this in the, in the next chapter. But for now, what we're going to try and see is what is the theological messaging? When you read the book of Acts, uh, especially in, the, in this chapter of Acts 8, a lot of it is focused on Philip's uh, journey in, in, in evangelism in Samaria. Uh, later on, he would actually get the, the nickname or the title uh, Philip the Evangelist because he was very evangelistic in his ministry, in his journey. Uh, so here is a map of, uh, you know, what it was like during Jesus' time. So you see here the region, Judea is in the south, Samaria is somewhere uh, in, in the north, and then Galilee. Most of the time because of their uh, beef, of Samarians with the, with the Jewish people, the, uh, the Jewish from Galilee would actually travel uh, further off uh, in the east uh, to avoid the whole region of Samaria. They would actually go around the uh, area of Perea so that they can just get to Jerusalem. That's how they would travel because that's, that's the beef they had with Samaria. Okay, uh, in Acts uh, 1 verse 8, if you remember, this is all the way in Acts chapter 1, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in all Judea, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now, uh, again, continuing in verse 4 of, of chapter 8. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed them to Christ. And the crowds uh, with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they said, and when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, uh, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had uh, who had them, uh, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. So here, Philip, this is one of the seven. This is not one. This is not the apostle Philip. Uh, I'm saying this because, as we all know, Philip 
his Greek name was Philippos. He was one of the Hellenists. Um, and by this time, uh, Philip didn't really care about uh, Samaria because he was a Hellenist. He didn't grow up in Jerusalem. His, um, his mindset was not the same as the people in Jerusalem. So when he went to the Samaria, it was like, you know, I'm here to preach the word of God. I'm here to preach about Jesus. I'm here to, to share to people about it. He didn't really care or maybe even understood what the whole deal with Samaria was. So he was just there. So let me uh, go back first here. What, what is exactly, what is the deal with Samaria? Now, what Samaria is, if you don't know, and this is a brief history, uh, Samaria started with, uh, with one of the kings in, I think it's Jeroboam, if I'm mistaken. It is Jeroboam. In, in 1 Kings 11, verse 38, uh, where Jeroboam was asked to uh, lead Israel. And the God's plan for him was he was supposed to humble the Davidic line uh, of the kings uh, because he was not actually from the Davidic line. He was uh, a king. He was uh, uh, an aide or an assistant to Solomon. Okay, And uh, the plan was he was supposed to humble those who were uh, from the Davidic line, and, and this is what God says, if you do whatever I command you and walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands, as David, my servant, did, I will be with you. I will build a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. This was the command of God. Of course, he did not do this. Uh, he felt that everything that um, he did would be undermined because he was just being used by God. So uh, long story short, the Assyrians actually came out and, and then uh, captured the, the whole region. So here, the region of Samaria was the region of Manasseh and Ephraim. This is where the 10 tribes of Israel, uh, and, and this is where the, the whole uh, kingdom uh, the rule of Jeroboam kind of uh, um, was ruling over, okay? Um, the Assyrian policy, when the Assyrian conquered Samaria uh, on that region, what they do is they conquer people, they deport them to another conquered land and import other conquered people to the newly conquered land, okay? So uh, you can see this uh, happen in 2 Kings uh, chapter 17. So what this does is that uh, it kind of defeats the nationalism pride of people uh, because a lot of times you, you don't want to, uh, rebellion doesn't happen if it's, you're not fighting for your own homeland. Uh, you, normally you'd uh, have a rebellion uh, if people are actually uh, either fighting for their freedom to get out of your, your, uh, the, the, the place that they're in, like, like uh, Israel and Egypt, or they're fighting for the place that they're staying in. So what the Assyrians were doing was a psychological warfare where if we import them out, it's less likely that they would rebel against us because it's not their land anymore. Okay, so that's, that's their psychological warfare. So um, though... And at times, it would, uh, you know, after they get exiled, they would come back, you know, they would come back and they would see all these foreigners in their land. Now, those who stayed in, in Samaria were not originally Jewish people, you know, the ones who were uh, imported back into Samaria. They were not originally Jewish people. What they were, uh, were, uh, were pagans, okay? So when they, the two started mixing together, um, you know, under the authority uh, of Jeroboam, they, they, they apostatized. They started setting up their, their own system of worship. They're, they're mixing all these uh, other pagan religions and, and Judaism, uh, and they really become apostates. So what was the messaging when, what was the theological messaging when Philip went to Samaria? I know it's when Luke, when Luke records Acts, um, you could argue that, oh, he's only recording events that happened. And uh, when you read the book of Acts, when you read it, uh, oh, how it actually happened. This is where, if you really think about the theological messaging of how it came to be, um, 
you would you would be hard pressed to actually um, uh, what you call this disprove that it was the Holy Spirit moving all along. Okay, because what was the messaging uh, of Philip being in Samaria? That you know Jesus, the messaging is that Jesus is reclaiming everybody. Now Samaria is mentioned because they will get to hear the message of the cross and being offered salvation regardless of who they were in history, regardless if they were intermarrying with other, regardless if they were, uh, they were Jews who, uh, who apostatized, who started serving other gods, they would also be given access uh, to understanding what the message of the cross is with Christ. So this is, the, this is the messaging of the whole Philip being in Samaria. That's why, you know, uh, there was one chapter, I believe, that was, there was this one event, event after event that was recorded uh, so, so that the, so they'll understand uh, that the Holy Spirit or Jesus is reclaiming everybody and giving access to everybody. You know, if you recall Samaria in, in, in John 4, and we'll, we'll get to there a little bit. Uh, how do you know that Jesus wants the, the whole region of Samaria to understand uh, to, to know God. Well, you know, if you look back in John 4, uh, in verse 27, this was after the encounter of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So after the encounter, you know, they, they, they met, they met at the well. Um, they, Jesus said something about the woman, you know, you uh, bring your husband here. Oh, I don't have a husband. You're right. You actually have five husbands. You know, and then uh, the Samaritan woman was so amazed. She went back to the village. Um, did a study drop off? Yeah, she did. Uh, so she went yeah. back to the village and, and uh, basically she told everybody. So we start off here. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking to, with a woman, uh, a Samaritan woman, no less. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water, uh, her water jar, and went away into the town uh, and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So apparently they were also waiting for the Messiah in, in their scriptures. You know, they, they went out of the town and they were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is through the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there are four months, then comes the harvest. Here comes the interesting part. Look, I tell, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the, the fields are white for harvest or ripe in some translations. Uh, already the one who reaps is receiving wages Oh, 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 sorry. Already the one who is receiving wages is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For he is, for here the, the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So um, I think I forgot one verse here, the, the verse before this. Uh, Actually, it says here that the people started coming out. Uh, people started coming out of the village after the woman said, you know, uh, or here in verse 30, they went out of the town and they were coming to him, right? So if you can imagine the scene, the, the, the woman left us the well, and then she told everybody. And, and, and then a conversation ensued between Jesus and the disciples. And then you would see this crowd starting to come out of the village, going into the well, you know, and this is where that, that uh, phrase, when Jesus says, look, I tell you, he's pointing to the people. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the, the harvest are white for, uh, the fields are white for the harvest. So he, he was looking at them and says, you know, we, we the problem with us is that the, the, uh, we're only so few and there's a lot of work to be done. But when he was saying that, he was pointing out to who? The Samaritan people. The people that these guys hated, the people that these guys thought were, were, were below them because they were half-breeds. They were almost like pagans. 
uh, because they worship other other gods. They did other uh, they, they they did the other parts of worship which was not approved by Judaism. So to them, the Samaritans were uh, actually they would view the Samaritans as worse than than swine. Okay, <clears throat> so here is Jesus pointing out to the Samaritan people, look, the harvest is here. You know, so this will just go to show even Jesus' heart for the Samaritan people was there. He wasn't singling them out as uh, they're not worthy to be saved. Even, even he said to the apostles, the Samaritans are here and, and they are going to hear the word of God. They are going to hear my message to them. So, the, uh, sorry. And after the encounter with the Samaritan woman, you know, uh, okay, and, and that exactly what I just said, you know, he, he, Jesus went up to them and looked he said, look at this harvest. Look at these people. You know, so going back after um, the, the passage of Philip evangelizing and preaching to the Samaritan, <clears throat> and they heard and many miraculous signs came, then come to the story of Simon the sorcerer. Uh, I'm going to talk about Simon first. Uh, because I feel like you know it's 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 a weird transition if I go verse by verse, but um, here there, there was a man named Simon who has previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, "This man is the power of God that is called great," and they paid attention to him. Uh, because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Okay, so this is uh, the the guy in the black is uh, Simon the sorcerer, or Simon Magus. When they believed uh, Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of heaven in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Uh, so here, I'm going to go and touch a little bit on Simon the Sorcerer. So every Semitic culture, uh, Semitic meaning like the Hebrew race or the Jewish, and, and at this point, even the Samaritans, uh, every Semitic culture have their own Targum or translation of the scriptures. Uh, so the, uh, if by this time, people were quoting the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So even the Samaritans have their own uh, translation, okay? So for them, El, uh, the Hebrew for God, is often represented by the Aramaic word Kela, which means power, okay? Uh, the great power of, the, the power of God that is called great. Uh, so this would normally be referred to as Kela Rabbah. So Simon the sorcerer was not only revered by people, but people actually considered him as somebody from God or equal to God because of the magic he was showing. Whether he was practicing black magic or he was just doing the sleight of hand kind of thing or he was actually performing miracles, we don't know. But the people uh, knew enough to revere him and actually equate him uh, with God. That's why the, the, this man is the power of God that is called great. They actually called him Kela Rabah, uh, which is great power which is, you know, the power that's, that is from God. So you can, uh, you can picture in your head, how did people revere or how did, how did uh, what was the reputation of Simon Magus or Simon the Sorcerer? Okay, so going back to Simon the Sorcerer, I'll, I'll start reading in verse 17. I'm, I'm going to deal with verse 14 to 16 a bit later. So here, Peter started coming down to Jerusalem and started laying down his hands on people, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, this receiving of the Holy Spirit is the outdwelling of the Spirit, meaning they start performing miracles. Okay, so then verse 17, then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw the Spirit was given to the laying of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God, uh, the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. 
Repent, therefore, of the wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that none of what you have said may come upon me. Now they had testified and broken the word and spoken the word of the Lord, and they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many of the villages of the Samaritans. Okay, so here again going back to Simon the sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer did believe in Jesus. He did become a believer. He surrendered his practice. He surrendered the title of being equal with God. And he actually claimed that Jesus is the actual son of God, you know, and uh, that he is, um, and he believed that uh, Jesus was the Messiah. He was a believer, okay? But he did ask a very naive question to Peter. You know, he saw that, that Peter was there and he was, laying hands and people were having miracle and he wanted to do that. Um, and of course he was rebuked by Peter is what the text says. And he, he admitted he was wrong. Well, kind of, if you kind of read the text, you kind of get this feel like, okay, 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 then I'm sorry then. Okay. <clears throat> so in the text, it doesn't really say that he was a bad guy, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, what the text is actually saying is that, he, he actually believed in Jesus. Uh, and like many young Christians, uh, they're entitled to asking the wrong things. <clears throat> so in here, Simon still went on and actually, you know, had this past still with him in his heart. You know, it, it was more of, oh, you're, 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 you're doing, I want what you're doing. You know, so the reflection of Simon the Sorcerer's conversion was, Simon started out his journey of faith. He renounced his ways. He, he actually started it right. He was baptized. He repented. Okay, but a lot of his past caught, caught, caught up with him. After he saw the miracles of Peter's laying of hands, uh, and he thought, you know, I, my, my, my mind was going uh, back and forth with the different things of what he might have thought. Like, oh, I want, oh, if, if he's giving that away, I want what he's having. I want what he's giving out of it. You know, so, so he actually, and, and uh, this is what, as what most rich people do, they, they feel like they can buy things out. Oh, let me just, let me just buy this from you. Um, so he offered silver. So um, you can imagine uh, psychologically what was going through Simon's head. Okay, the, the idea, he, here's the thing, the idea that, that to follow Jesus uh, requires the same criteria in the Old Testament. Okay, it requires deciding loyalty. I mean, what does this mean? It requires for you to decide to be loyal every single day to Jesus. So, in the text, it doesn't say if Simon went bad. Uh, it doesn't say if, if if Simon left the faith. There are, and I won't put it here in the notes, but there are uh, Christian fathers like Tertullian, Irenaeus. Um, the, those who, who took over after, uh, after the Apostle John, uh, who recorded, even Justin Martyr, uh, recorded that there was a movement for some Simonians who actually said that their founder was Simon Magus. And what Simonians do is they mix a lot of things together from the occult to uh, Jesus, to, uh, Jesus' teaching, to uh, Judaism, so, uh, and, and what they do, you can actually look it up. It's in Wikipedia, uh, the, the Simonians. So uh, history would only say that Simon, Simon Magus didn't fully, or he left the faith eventually. But according to this text, according to Acts 8, all it says is that, you know, he, he was this kind of guy who was, had one foot in the door and the other foot on the outside. You know, he, he wasn't fully... Uh, committed to the idea that Jesus was Lord. That's, that's what a lot of writers are saying. Um, but if we're just going to base it on a text, he did follow, uh, he did humble himself enough, he did repent himself enough and get, got baptized to follow Jesus. Um, but like what, what most of people who follow Jesus who realize they're not, they can't live the life that they want, 
eventually leave the faith. So this was just a lesson that, that I feel like uh, Luke was trying, if Luke was trying to say something to, to Theophilus, this was more of, you remember that guy, Simon Magus? Yeah, that, that guy. This was, he actually became a Christian. I feel like that's the way Luke was trying to, to phrase his story to Theophilus. Because he would mention people that mattered to Theophilus, right? He would mention people that Theophilus kind of knew about. And Theophilus was Greek. You know, oh, oh yeah, that guy. You know, so, he was meant, so he was telling Theophilus, this is the story of that guy who you know. He actually became a Christian. He actually became part of the church. So uh, <clears throat> that again, that's just my opinion. Uh, you you would be hard pressed to find out uh, if any of the scholars actually believe that. But I, I'm just thinking more from the sake of, from the side of Luke writing to Theophilus, and why would he write about this guy? So it uh, it's it's apparent that that he wants Theophilus to know uh, how this guy actually even started. Okay, but again, moving on, um, I want to talk about the, this, this topic about Peter's arrival and the laying of hands and uh, the idea of outpouring versus indwelling. So we're, we're kind of done there. We're, we're going to take a break a little bit and talk a little bit about this because this is giving confusion to a lot of Pentecostals, Catholic charismatics, uh, and people who want to discuss doctrine. Who is Mumu? This is Ivan. Oh, no, Ivan's done. Okay. Hi, Mumu. Who are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> is this Mulio? Yes. Okay, Mumu. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Undercover. So, in, in verse 14, going back to before Simon the Sorcerer, uh, here, here's the question that's, that's, or the verse that's kind of causing a little bit of confusion. Because as we know, in Acts 2, the formula for conversion is you repent and you get baptized. Well, I, I use formula in a very loosest uh, form possible, yeah. Uh, but this is how they were baptizing people, and this is how they were converting, uh, those who were uh, converting from Judaism to Christianity. Uh, they were they were hearing the word, they were repenting, and then they got baptized. Okay, so when Philip went to Samaria, he preached the word of God and he baptized people, and they were rejoicing because they was they were seeing miracles be, getting performed and happening right before their eyes. So when the apostles in verse fourteen, now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, keep in mind what Samaria is. They didn't like Samaria. As a culture, they didn't like what Samaria represented. Okay, and when they when they heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, the, the two big headshots, uh, head honchos, okay, who came down and prayed for them and that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet uh, fallen on any of them. He, uh, meaning the Holy Spirit, had, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, they know that the command of, of Jesus was, you will spread the word, you will spread the good news to Judea and Samaria. They know this. In Acts 1 verse 8, this is what Jesus told them. But they weren't going to Samaria yet. They were, they were staying in Jerusalem for quite a long time. Uh, eight years to be exact. So when Philip here and, and started preaching to Samaria, uh, John, Peter and John started hearing about it. I said, oh, okay, let's check this out. Let's see if God's plan is really for them to be part of this, right? So their, their litmus test, if God really does approve the Samaritans or the Samaritans to be part of the kingdom, is that the Holy Spirit would be evident in them. If we lay our hands on them, then the, then the miracles manifest themselves. Then this is God saying, yeah, that they're part of the kingdom. Those who believe in Jesus will be part of the kingdom. Those who are called in the name of Jesus will be part of the kingdom. So now, now when they testified and spoke in the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So even after that one village Philip preached, Peter and John went back to Jerusalem 
And because they were so convinced that the Samaritans were part of God's kingdom, they started preaching to many people along the way about Jesus. Okay, so even they were convinced, okay, they're, they're part of, of, the, of the kingdom of God. Now, here's the question that a lot of people ask. You know, they were baptized. Okay, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that enough? Okay, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit, what, what Peter and John was doing was confirming. This, this is not a normative event. This is a one-off event. Okay, this is not an event that, that happens every single time. Oh, they, after that, they're going to lay their hands. This was more of, of Peter and John uh, being convinced by the Holy Spirit that the Samaritans are part of the plan. Okay, uh, in here, in this book of the Spirit by Doug Jacoby, I'm just going to quote this. The Samaritans were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Which baptism is this? Baptism in Jesus' name in Acts 2 verse 38. Uh, this is the normal Christian baptism, bringing forgiveness and the spirit, the, the indwelling of the spirit. They were already saved. The outward reception of the spirit, visible to Simon the sorcerer, who saw something that amazed him, was given by God through the apostles as a sign to the brothers that God, has, that had, that God had accepted the Samaritans. There was, no, there was to be no further requirement for salvation. So we see that Acts 8 is no exception to the rule of Acts 2 verse 38. So what, what uh, Doug Jacoby is trying to say is that uh, this thing that happened, the laying of hands that happened afterwards where the miracles manifested, this wasn't something normal that would happen every single time. This was something that, that came about because Peter and John wanted to be sure uh, that, that the Holy Spirit is approving of this plan. Okay, so this was the reason why they had to be, uh, they, had, they had to lay their hands on the Samaritan people, right? at least those who believed in Jesus, all right? So uh, this is not something that you do in church normally, or oh, I'm laying my hands on you so you can run, run up and down the pews and, and, and claim miracles happening. That's not what it is, okay? This is not something that would happen every single Sunday service, Okay, this is just something, again, to repeat myself, this is just something that Peter and John did to show everybody in Jerusalem that the Samaritans were also approved uh, to, uh, by the Holy Spirit to hear the word of God or to hear the message of the cross. Okay, now, so going from there, we go to the, uh, from the scripture, we go to the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, now, Let's read this first before I, go to, before I go any further. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. That is, this is a desert place. Okay. And he went and rose and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, uh, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He came to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So several things, okay? Uh, what is with Ethiopia? What's with Ethiopia? Um, the Septuagint refers to the area of south of Egypt as Kush, okay? But uh, itops actually means uh, people with burnt faces. Yeah, that's that's uh, not racist. That's just a description of the physical aspect of people. Okay, uh, so what is the eunuch doing with a scroll? It is most likely the eunuch was a proselyte, meaning he was a convert to Judaism because he was coming after all to, Jude to Jerusalem to worship. Okay, so he, he was an Ethiopian who converted to Judaism. Uh, that, is what that is why it explains he was coming to worship. And that's also why, it, uh, why he's able to read Hebrew when he was reading the scroll. Okay, because he was a convert. Um, now, as you know, what uh, so Itops or Ethiopia was the term they used for the whole north uh, of Africa or everything south of Egypt, because they were describing the people, an Ethiopian. This was not describing the country, just to let you know. Okay, uh, Candice was also not an actual name, but a proper name meaning the, a title, the, the queen of the Ethiopians. Uh, 
So it would be like saying, oh, this is the 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 ratu of of uh, of Jogja. Uh, the ratu is the queen of Jogja. You know, so that's that's like what it's saying. It'll be weird if the queen was actually named Candice. It's such an American sounding name. <laughs> so uh, Candice, he was a queen of the So it's not an African name at all. <laughs> you know. So uh, I, I wonder if it was actually pronounced as Kandache, you know? So uh, again, that's just my thought. Uh, nothing scholarly about it or nothing proved about it, but uh, this was a proper name for a queen of, of the Ethiopians. So what was the, here in Ethiopia was not mentioned in the, in the list of nations in Acts 2, much as uh, Cyprus was not mentioned, Antioch was not mentioned. Um, and, and uh, it was here, the theological messaging of those who were not even mentioned in Acts 2, those who came to Jesus on, on Pentecost. Uh, little by little, uh, Luke is saying part of his story is that, hey, listen, it's reaching out everywhere. People who are, who I didn't even mention, they were part of that number. They were, the, 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 the word of Jesus, the word of Christ, the message of the cross is reaching everybody. Okay, so and the spirit said to Philip, go over and, and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone guides me? Uh, and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture uh, that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. This is Isaiah 53, by the way. And like a lamb before his shear is silent and he opens his not, not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Uh, who can describe this generation for his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, and, and uh, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began with this scripture. And he told him the good news about Jesus. And they were going along uh, and the road and, and, came, and came to some water. I don't know how they came to some water in the desert, but they did. That's, that's God for you. Okay, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? I love the way the ESV translate this. I almost can hear the accent of, of the person. See, here is water. You know, it's like this, this African accent comes out, you know, and, and he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went into the water. Philip and the eunuch, uh, uh, they, went back, they went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they came up out of the water. The spirit rejoiced. Uh, carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. I, I just wanted to just touch on the story of what happened. I don't know how long the chariot ride took. It might have taken a day. It might have taken two days. It, it definitely wasn't a ride from Pasabaru to Block M. You know, it, it took a lot longer than that. You know, so uh, it was a chariot ride. So what, what was, it? this is your typical one-on-one uh, -on -one evangelism and one-on-one -on -one Bible study in, in conversion. What, what was preached to the Ethiopian eunuch? Uh, Jesus. You know, they, he was made to understand uh, or he was given clarification on who Jesus was. And uh, he, when he saw water, uh, it wasn't some nonchalant thing. Hey, look, here's water. You know, they were, they were coming in a chariot ride and when they finally came to, oh, to water, he insisted that he got baptized. What's stopping me from getting baptized? Uh, here's water. You know, a lot of people today, I'm just putting this in more like a, a, a preaching side for me. Because, you know, when, when I hear people, they study the Bible, they, they come to know Christ. And, and you know, they, they hear all the messages. So when they ask, hey, do you want to become a Christian? Do you, do you want to repent? Do you want to follow Jesus? And the normal response in today's generation, in the, today's society is, eh, yeah, maybe I'll study out some more. I'll, I'll hear some more of this message. I'll decide if, if, if I'm there or not. You know, the, the eunuch, there was a sense of urgency for him because he realized this is more than just a religion. This is, this is more than just, Jude this is more than Judaism. You know, uh, it's, it's more than all this thing that he was taught. This is something that he was, has been uh, searching for and looking for. Okay, so um, I just wanted to uh, read on the scripture to, to, to help people understand or to help, you know, you guys understand. 
that when the message of the cross is preached to us or the message of Jesus is preached to us or, or we come to know Jesus, if people are not excited about it or not urgent about it, then it's being preached wrong. You know, and I'm saying this because I, I was listening to this uh, uh, to this pastor. I think Oka sent that interview, and, and he was saying, uh, "When you're a seeker sensitive, when you're a seeker sensitive church, and you build it like a business the way uh, the way Oprah does, and you have celebrity pastors like Stephen Furtick and and Andy Stanley and and." And uh, and maybe even Rick Warren. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that they're they're bad, you know. But you're 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 getting all these crowds to listen to you because they're amazed at how you speak, you know. And sooner or later, that the idea of uh, I need to follow Jesus doesn't become as as urgent as uh, oh, I want to listen to this guy again next week. You know, and I think that's the big difference when people were, were converting or, or coming to Christ in the first century was they were there. They understood what the message was about. They were not there for the personalities. They were not there for Peter and John. That's what Simon was there for. Oh, I, I like the miracle. You know, oh, I like the Sunday service. I, wa I, wanna, I want to be there for the Sunday service. That's not what the message of Jesus was all about. So touching on that, I, I think it this shows the attitude of people. Uh, Philip, uh, Luke was trying to touch on the, 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 the people Philip evangelized and what they were like. So you had one guy who didn't completely understand the message. And you have this guy, the Ethiopian eunuch, who said, you know, in, in all humility, him being a eunuch, him having that, that stature or on that standing in, in the society, I want to get baptized, you know? So there was such a contrast between the two, okay? And here at the last part of the verse, in the last part of the chapter, and they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. I don't know how that looks like, okay? I'm just going to take it as uh, he led Peter away in, in that direction, okay? Uh, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing, okay? Uh Oh, I forgot to put verse, verse 40. Okay, but it says there that he was uh, led to Azotus. Okay, but okay, uh, maybe I'll deal with it in the next slide. So here, uh, and they came out, and after they were baptized, the eunuch came out rejoicing. He came out after he was baptized, he was rejoicing. Okay, he didn't see Philip anymore. Okay, uh, what can one man do? You know, in reality, nothing. Not, nothing much, okay? What can the Holy Spirit do in one man? Everything, okay? And this picture shows you in here at the bottom part, this is Northern Africa, right? You see here, that's where it is. In the first century, this is where all the concentration of churches or, or, or congregations that kind of sprouted up uh, in the first century. So just by this alone, just by historical setting alone, you can tell that the one who started it all, this might be the reason why also Luke mentioned him. You know, by this time, the word of God was spreading in North Africa. And you know who spread it? This guy. Because that's why Luke was mentioning it. Okay, because this Ethiopian eunuch, from this one guy, all these people who started converting from Nobatia, Mokiria, Alodia, uh, they, they all became... Uh, that the, the, the word of God spread in this region uh, quite widespread, actually. Okay. Okay. And this, this is the one I was talking about, the epilogue to the prologue. Uh, but Philip found himself at Azotus and he passed through the, uh, and he passed through, he, uh, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So this is where it was. He was from here in Azotus. You know, and he preached all the way to there. So he preached, he preached to the coastline uh, of uh, Israel at that time, or, or the region at that time. Joppa, by the way, uh, here, uh, what you would see here would actually be uh, the modern-day Tel Aviv in Joppa. That's where it is. Okay. 
So what is Azotus? Why is that a big deal? Azotus is known as the Philistine city of the Asdod or the, the Philistines. Okay, they were still associated with the Nephilim, the Anakim, and even Goliath. Right? So why would the Holy Spirit bring him there? It's obvious. Yahweh is also claiming, this is also mine. Okay? He's, he's not pulling the punches anymore. From the, from the nations that were dispersed or disinherited and separated in Babel, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit directs the hands and the works of the apostles and gives, without a doubt, the theological me messaging of I am claiming them all back. Because after this, when you read Acts 9, and what's in Acts 9? The, the conversion of Paul. Okay, And actually, when you read in, in, in Acts 10, where, where, where Peter converted Cornelius, uh, the title was actually the conversion of Cornelius, but actually what it is is the conversion of Peter. Because here is where Peter gets convinced that God even wants the Gentiles to hear the message of God. All right. So what it is, what this is, the whole book of Acts, especially in, in, in Acts 8, the messaging of what, of what Luke writes it as part of the importance of these people. I believe the Holy Spirit was guiding him in helping people understand that there's a theological messaging in the geographical settings that was being set from Samaria to Gaza, uh, I mean, to, to Azotus, to even to Caesarea. These were all uh, heavy uh, from, uh, from the people that, you know, that, that they had this conflict with. Uh, they were pagans, they were, they were Gentiles. And this was, like I said, uh, the epilogue to the Jerusalem church becomes now a prologue to the Gentile church starting. In, in Acts 9, where you would see uh, Paul getting converted. Okay, so I just wanted to focus on Acts 8 because I wanted to help you understand what was the big deal with Samaria. What was the big deal with all these people getting converted? Who were these people? Um, and then, of course, uh, along the way for us to understand that the, Holy, the, the theological messaging of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is that, okay, Jerusalem's done. Jerusalem heard it. It's now time to spread the news and it's now time to spread it everywhere. And this is the message that the Holy Spirit wants to start in Acts 8. All right. So that will be the end of the, the session for today. Um, so we, we can start off with some thoughts and comments for you guys. I mean, if you have any questions as well. Uh, Rich, yeah. just now you were talking about the people, um, Ethiopia as the people, right? Not the country because, yeah. so in basically it was referring to African people. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, because most of the African region uh, they only, like in the Septuagint, they would only refer to it as Kush, the Kushites, uh, which by the way, uh, so that would mean that uh, Moses married, uh, Mir Mir uh, who was his wife's name? Uh, so Moses married actually a, a, a darker, uh, darker woman who was not, uh, who was not Jewish. Okay, okay. So does it have any um, relation to the country of Ethiopia now? Or uh, do you think? Some say it does uh, because the Greek translation for Ethiopia was I, I, I tops. You know, uh, eventually I think Ethiopia, uh, what do you call this? Again, don't quote me on this because I'm not sure. I think they, they adopted yeah. that name for some reason later on. Mm. As, as that region so uh, i don't know if it's a matter of uh, uh the kinds of people who were living there so I, I have to do my research some more but so the the word used in the septuagint was it, it, uh, itops so it was actually referring more to the people rather than the country okay okay
Okay, Tari. Bye, Tari. See you. Any anyone has a? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, could you could you tell me more about why is it if let's say the person you've finished studying with and. Uh, this person is not, not that excited to get baptized. It would have to be your fault. So tell me more about that. <laughs> well, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, I'm just saying a lot of people today, uh, because of all the things in the middle, um, say their experiences with other denominations, uh, their um they 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 kind of question. Uh, they they look at you through a microscope and scrutinize your life first and say, "Oh, are you really a Christian? Uh, or why are you doing this? How do you come? You speak this way, or how you know?" So, um, a lot more people these days are focused on the person rather than rather than Jesus and the message of the cross. Okay, and rightfully so. You know, uh, I, I would say that there are a lot of those who been burned by relationships uh there are those who what we call today jesus freaks which turns a lot of people off you know so uh when i say oh you're studying the bible and they're not excited I, i'm not saying it's your fault personally or or the one studying the bible with them is fault as in there's a lot of their mind is clouded by a lot of things uh by a lot of things that that doesn't make them focus on the actual message so that's one uh, when I study the Bible these days, uh, I, I tell people, listen, I, my life is far from perfect, you know, but I try, you know, uh, I, and what, and there will be no such thing as a perfect church because every church will have its controversy. The only thing that's perfect is the message of the cross. The only thing that's perfect is Jesus. So um, you can look at it as you can look at your baggage and says, that's what's stopping you. Or you can look at Jesus and says, you know, it's, uh, nothing should stop me from becoming a true and actual Christian, you know, the real kind, the, the, not the one that says, oh, I belong to this church, so I'm a, I'm a Christian in this church, you know, you, know, you should go beyond the personalities and, and the, the awesome eloquence of, of uh, Sunday service, but really look at what the message, what the message of Jesus really is. So not nothing for you personally, but really just, like I said, it's it's about what goes between that person and Jesus and in what's clouding their vision in between. Because yeah, Rich, go ahead, Mario. yeah, I have a question. You yeah. know, I've been at, attending uh, like different Jibos, Yeah, yours is uh, uh, to, to, to me. I think is is most educational. I think what confuses me, what confuses me at at times at different devos is um, people express their understanding on a scripture, um, but somehow it, it, there, there's no consistency from di from different uh, leaders in the in the devo. In a way, it it it, it, it confuses me. Mm. Uh, and and yet we say churches are that the devos are churches. You know, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so uh, how should I do this? Yeah, because sometimes we, you see you hear someone who is so con you know full of conviction, but in a way I know that it's not right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. What 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 do you do with that? How do you, you deal with that? You know, and and. I don't know if it's First Timothy or Second Timothy, where he says, uh, um, you know, uh, it was talking about life and doctrine, and you need to guard your life and your doctrine. Um, I always believe that there's a certain balance to a lot of things. Uh, and, and, and the balance or the fulcrum part of the balance is, is, is there for you to never be relaxed on, on what you believe. Um, if you are focusing so much on doctrine, a lot of times you forget that you know it's you, you need to have relationships and you need to be an example to the society and, and your community and 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 project Christ to people. And 
sometimes when people say, oh, I have to be good, I have to, yeah, but you, you forget your theological understanding in your understanding of the cross. So, uh, and, and, and what is the messaging all about? So there is always that balance. Uh, so there's, there's that point where I believe, oh, I, I, I know, I, I go to these other Hebrews classes and I go to, sometimes I visit Joe's classes and, and, and all this. Um, yeah, Joe, Joe Cortez uh, Devos. Um, even in my, you know, it's funny, even in my CG, they, you preach one message and people take away one thing because they, they, they hear what they want to hear. They don't hear what you want to say, what you're actually saying. So what am I saying is this. Um, you take everything with a grain of salt. You know, you, you listen to what they're saying. Okay, what's the truth there? Um, that's, uh, that's, okay, how am I, I want to share this with an example. Uh, because there was one time somebody was preaching or talking about David and Goliath, right? And he said, so what do, you, what do you see in the story of David and Goliath? You know, so somebody goes, oh, uh, I feel like I have a lot of Goliaths in my life, you know, and uh, I have a lot of things uh, to, to overcome and all this. And uh, somebody says something else, oh, I, I feel like I can be David, I can be more courageous, and, you know, I five stones, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and I'm going, I'm looking at, listen, it's not about you. It's not about Goliath. It's not even about David. It's about God. You know, it's about God winning the victory. It's about, it was, it's about his faith in God and how God gave him the victory. You know, so when you start thinking about scripture that way, um, there's a big trap. But it, it, on that note, it takes for someone to think that way until for them to realize Oh, they need to think of it differently because I thought that way. I thought of, of Christian messaging scriptures as something, oh, what do I do in my life? What, what do I, uh, and that's what most people do today, you know, but the real point is, is that what the Bible, the whole messaging of the Bible is who is God and what does God do and what does God want? And where are you in that picture? Okay, if you can focus on that center message, you know, when you say, oh, what do I do? Then you, you got to understand, okay, who is God? What does God want? And what do I do with what God wants? What do I follow? How do I follow? Um, so, Umulio, can you give me an example of what you've heard that kind of confuses you? Mumu, are you there? <laughs> it must have been froze. I don't know if you've heard if you've heard anything. I have. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I I hear you. Sorry. Um, yeah. Basically, every time, uh, like yesterday, we were talking about uh, with Ashok and Arvin about the Old Testament. Yeah, you 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 dropped off. Hello, I think you froze. Yeah, 